A controversial conclusion to the career for Dr. Diana Green. This week, she decides to retire as superintendent at the end of the school year. Duval County School Board Chair Dr. Kelly Coker explains where she stands on the question, was Green forced out? Councilwoman Leanna Cumber has been fighting for the rights of sexual abuse victims and trying to prevent the crimes. She weighs in on what's happening in the River City when it comes to reporting those crimes. And as the campaign's near a close in the run for Jacksonville's new mayor, we're looking at the final days for Donna Deegan and Daniel Davis. Florida Times Union columnist Nate Monroe joins us on This Week in Jacksonville. And good morning. Uh, for the first time on a Sunday in May, Duval County Public School Superintendent Dr. Diana Green. We learned this week she will step down and retire at the end of the school year. A divided school board agreed to that during an emergency meeting Tuesday. And that was the headline as Green, along with her attorneys, negotiated her early retirement settlement. Severance agreement approved by the board, uh, the school board that is, with a four to three vote. And the emergency meeting came just days after the city's attorneys had hired an outside law firm to conduct a wide-ranging investigation into teacher misconduct in the district and how it's reported to the state. So joining us right now, two weeks in a row, by the way, board chairwoman, Dr. Kelly Coker, I appreciate uh, joining us. Where does the investigation on Douglas Anderson stand and those complaints? Because that's really what took us forward to what we're going to talk about next. Sure. Uh, so at this point, um, when I was here last time, we had begun um, hiring a third party investigator um, through the Office of General Counsel, grateful for all of their assistance during that time, during this time. That has occurred and the beginning steps of that investigation are happening. Um, it's going to take some time. We need some patience from the public. They'll be looking at two items. They'll be looking at what happened at DA that allowed a teacher like Jeffrey Clayton to stay in the classroom for a number of years, despite multiple allegations. It will also look at those 50 cases that were sent to the FDOE recently, um, some of them dating back to 2020 that needed to have been reporting, reported and, and, and what exactly happened that pre preempted them from getting there. We also took two additional steps this week though. Um, one of the items we kept hearing about was the Douglas Anderson Foundation. Um, while, the, and the, while the school board doesn't have any authority or jurisdiction over that foundation, um, the board has charged me as the board chair with crafting a letter to make them aware of the third party investigation and ensure that as they are um, paying people through that foundation for services and work, that they're aware of this um, investigation so that if anyone does come out on the backside of this with, a, with an issue or a problem, that the foundation's aware of that. Um, the other item that we looked at this week and that we're moving forward on is we've been really fortunate. Lots of alumni have reach out, reached out to us. We've had lots of former parents who have reached out to us and former staff, but we haven't actually been at DA to talk to the current students the current parents and the current teachers of that building. And so before the end of the school year, we're going to do some listening sessions to hear from them about what their perspectives are and the support they need to get this school on the right track for our children. So these complaints came out about a month ago and uh, what has funneled through the process here ended up this, this past week with Dr. Green uh, and this retirement. So tell us, do you feel it's appropriate that Dr. Green would retire or step away or should she have been part of staying through to see what happens in this investigation and trying to solve whatever problems are there, whether it's DA or district-wide. Sure. Well, first off, I think it's important for the public to know, and I mentioned this in the meeting this past week and in a press conference as well. Actually, Dr. Green came to me on April 17th. We met in the evening at the school board building, and she started her conversation with, I need to let you know I'm retiring, that I would like to see these children through commencement that are getting ready to graduate, and then after that, I'm looking to move on. And we didn't have a date certain or anything along those lines. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt. So that When was that conversation? April 17th, just okay. a few weeks ago. And it was clear that she's a woman of faith and, and, and very thoughtful and very reflective that she had come to that decision. It was just time for a new chapter. So we are excited for her to begin that chapter. Negotiations happen anytime someone of a $2 billion organization such as Duval County with 13,000 employees, 130,000 students, you know, a negotiation for that retirement would happen. Um, and so that has, that has all transpired. As to whether it would have been good for her or not to stay, I will say it would not have been relevant because she planned to retire. But I, I, I think in terms of keeping the, the situation really objective, her retirement makes that real objective scenario possible for the investigators. We're looking at some video of Dr. Green over the years and, and most recent uh, time serving as superintendent. Uh, some of the board members uh, say that they believe Dr. Green was forced out. So I want to ask you a question about that. I want to first hear from one of the, the board members, the sure. former board chair, uh, Daryl Willey. 
we can list the myriad of accolades that Dr. Green has uh, afforded this community. Um, from her being named as superintendent of the year, half penny sales tax, one mil, um, schools off the F list, like the list goes on and on. And make no mistake, we're not here by accident. She's not retiring early. She's been forced out. That's how this works. That's how this works. But she's going to be strong because she always is. If you know Dr. Green, she's one of the strongest people you'll ever meet. All right, Dr. Coker, so to the point, you said April 17th, she says she wants to retire, but this Douglas Anderson thing is emerging. So is there any connection between the two? Because that certainly seems to be what some of the board members are saying. Hey, this feels like this was politically motivated pressure for her to retire. You know, uh, so from Dr. Green's side, did she feel political pressure to retire? I can't speak to that. I can only speak to me as a board member in District 1 that represents that district very proudly. There was no political pressure at all. Uh, she's a woman that I spoke with and quite candidly wanted to retire. So helping her get to that next chapter makes sense. I will say the DA investigation didn't weigh, it was a piece of a puzzle, but it was not the only piece. I will say there are some metrics in the district that I think we've got to attend to. Um, such as a declining graduation rate. We've had attendance, uh, we've had uh, enrollment issues in terms of declining enrollment. Um, and we also have a 47 to 50% proficiency rate depending upon the grade level, which means two of four students in our district aren't reading at grade level. And quite candidly, we need to refocus our energies on that. Dr. Green has done many, many great things, but it's uh, the evolution of an organization is that new leadership does come from time to time. And this just seemed to be that moment for me due to, due to that data, those objective facts. Do you feel like she did a good job in the time that she's been here? Because oh. where Duval County was when she came in, it, it seems like the district is uh, several places down the road from where it was oh, five or six years ago. Absolutely. When you look at the two referenda that were passed, we're going to have schools that are brand new for our children and refurbished for our children. She also passed a referenda that are going to allow the arts and physical education areas and athletic facilities to be refurbished. Um, and part of that also, that second referenda will give resources to our teachers that are much needed. Um, when you look at her leadership during COVID, my goodness, she was phenomenal getting technology into homes so that children could keep their learning, delivering lunches into neighborhoods through school buses. She was amazing. The metrics I'm talking about have happened in the last year, and I've talked about them in the board meetings that we've had. But she, I mean, overall, we're, we're grateful that Dr. Green was here. Our district is in a better space because of it. No question. No question. Final question for you. Was or is there a pattern of ignoring or sweeping sexual assault complaints under the rug? And this goes back to those 50 complaints that weren't forwarded to the state and that sort of thing. I don't, I, I will say that's the reason for the third party investigation is to determine, uh, you know, have we, have we done that? I don't know it for fact one way or the other, but we're going to get to the bottom of it as a board with this third party investigation. And we look forward to making sure we put safeguards um, in place in the future, future to protect our children. Because as a board, that's our top priority. Dr. Coker, I appreciate the time today. Always. And two weeks in a row. <laughs> there you go. All right, stay with us. Some city leaders are, are weighing in with their concerns about the school district's kind of crisis here. And city Council Member Leanna Cumber talks about what she wants to see change across the city. And that's next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. City Council's Leanna Cumber represents the San Marco area in District 5. She's a mother of two children. She's a former bilingual education teacher. And I asked her this week about her concerns with the school board's handling so far of the crisis at Douglas Anderson and with delayed reporting of complaints to the state. I think, unfortunately, the city has kind of a long-standing history in of ignoring and sweeping under the rug sexual assault and sexual harassment. I mean, going back from Trinity Baptist, when for decades child sexual assault was swept under the rug, to Kent Sturman, who we just found out was propositioning a minor, um, to Todd Smith, the EO EOC head, who we just found out yesterday from the state of Missouri that there's allegations of sexual assault, to DA. and. What I would say is there needs to be a serious overhaul. And as far as the school district is concerned, there needs to be, it cannot, these sorts of issues and solutions are not, solutions are not found by allowing someone to retire um, or even firing one person. There needs to be a wholesale 
really upending because clearly there is a reporting problem throughout the city and these issues need to be brought to the light of day and reported it's the only way that they stop maybe explain to people why this uh, this is something that's personal you uh, it's clearly this is an effort as you've been a, a legislator and city council you're saying hey we need to address issues of sexual assault and abuse yeah it's um look it's something that i've worked on from before i was on council and then from working on sex trafficking to just this past week passing a bill that kind of clarifies and makes our laws stronger in what child sexual offenders can put in their yards that might entice children to come to houses. It's really important as a mom of you know a 10 and a 12 year old, my husband and I talk to them all the time about safety and so forth. And, but as adults, we need to protect our kids. And part of what I think is so disturbing as a parent, as someone who's worked on these issues for so long, is what's going on in the school system is the, what's happened is it's unthinkable that adults would attack and abuse children. But the fact that there has been a lack of reporting of these crimes and that's what they are, then what are we to tell our kids? We're always, you know, we tell our kids, tell an adult. Find a safe adult and tell an adult. Well, if the end result is they tell an adult and nothing happens, then what are our kids supposed to believe? And that's why, I mean, you look at sexual assault, it's the most under underreported crime in the country. And this is why we're seeing it play out in the school district right now. So I really hope that they take it seriously and do a full overhaul. I'm sure there are other people in the district that should lose their jobs over this and make sure that the adults in the room are doing their jobs. Did you feel like the superintendent is one of those people, whether she knew about the underreporting or non-reporting or not? Do you think that she should have taken the accountability or the blame for this? Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, she, you know, when you are, whether you're superintendent, whether you're mayor, the buck stops with you, right? And under state law, it's a state requirement that she is responsible for the reporting. And I know there's, I think, 12 different criminal acts that the district needs to report within a 24-hour period of any arrest or so forth. That all goes to her. And so, to me, to allow for a retirement is also signaling that there's no accountability for what happened. Because what we can't forget is these are children. These are children that are being abused, being harassed, being, I mean, we have the Internet Crimes Against Children Unit here under JSO is twice as active this year than it was all of last year. And if you think about that, that is terrifying as a parent and everyone in the city should be really scared of that and should be doing everything we can to protect our kids. And I just can't say that that's been happening at the school district. As a member of city council, you don't have direct influence on what happens at the school board. What about other instances in the consolidated government? You said there are, you feel like there's a pattern of sweeping sexual assault under the rug. I, like a lot of people in Jacksonville saw the news reports yesterday on the head of the EOC and saw the letter from the state of Missouri top law enforcement and saw what was reported to be the response from the city, which was not to do what they said they were gonna do and put, you know, actually reprimand the head of the EOC, Todd Smith, and investigate it. And um, it looks like all they did was give a talking to. And that's, that's a signal being sent that these things are, they can be allowed to happen. And that's really disturbing. And so I think with that, along with, again, you know, we all know what happened with Kent Sturman. And um, I think just a couple weeks ago, there was the report, police report on him soliciting a minor. Those are the sorts of things that when you start seeing the pattern, we need to all get together as a community and say no more. All right, you can hear more from my interview with Councilwoman Cumber, including her view on the negative campaigning in the race for mayor right now on News for Jax Plus. It's available on Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, Android TV, Chromecast. You just search News for Jax on your streaming device. You download, and then once you're there, you're going to find this interview under the This Week in Jacksonville channel.
All right, we're talking about Duval Schools, JEA, and the candidates for mayor. Nate Monroe, a leading commentator in the city, the Times Union columnist, joining us next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. Nate Monroe has been a reporter and columnist for the Florida Times Union since 2013 and an award-winning uh, journalist in the Southeast more than a decade joining us today. Nate, I appreciate it. Uh, so we partner with Melissa Ross, Anthony Austin, a mayoral forum this week, and we've been asking the candidates for mayor questions for weeks. What are voters, in your mind, Nate, what are voters looking for in this final week plus before Election Day? Well, I mean, I think our thought going into this forum was that voters wanted to hear from her in a little bit more specificity about things. Uh, public safety, of course, is, is always the top concern, and that was right. something we had her talk a lot about last night. And I know we, we took steps to make sure that she differentiated herself from Daniel Davis. You know, tell us how the way you would respond to things are different from your opponent, you know, because we don't always get that. Um, there, and there are issues of, of bipartisan consensus in the city, like uh, making downtown development a priority. You know, it's easy when both candidates say that at a debate uh, to kind of gloss over, well, wait a second, what's the difference between the two of you? And I think that was a, a good advantage about last night is that I think we got that contrast from her. And so to be specific, Donna Deegan appeared for our forum. Uh, Daniel Davis did not. Daniel Davis had an event that we didn't get to attend. It was uh, separate. But what do you take away from the content of the forum and the comments that Mr. Davis made at these other events? You know, interestingly, I mean, I think that um, Daniel Davis, you know, often uh, what will happen when you go from a, a primary to a general election is that uh, candidates try to move to the middle, try to appeal to more voters, maybe voters who wouldn't initially consider voting for them. Um, Daniel Davis is, is really um, tacking further to the right. Um, he is, and he's, he's doing forums, kind of wanting to do events where, where he gets to kind of control the terms. Um, you know, the, the forum we did last night um, with Mrs. Deegan is, you know, more a traditional format where we were the ones asking questions. She didn't know what the questions were going in. Um, that's not the kind of thing that, that uh, you know, Mr. Davis is interested in right now. All right, so let's shift our topic a little bit here. Our first two segments today focused on what's happened in the Duval County School District. A uh, vote on the board was four to three with some board members objecting to the retirement, pending retirement now, of Dr. Green. Uh, do you believe the superintendent was forced out for political reasons, or is it appropriate that the person at the top takes responsibility, accountability for something like what's going on in, at DA and et cetera? Right. Yeah, you can call it a retirement, but is it is it a resignation? Is there a difference? Um, or is it a termination? Is there a difference? I, this has been a very fast-moving story. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's actually been really hard, uh, even you know, as journalists who follow this stuff, to to get a lot of clarity about what exactly was behind her decision uh, to retire. It sort of seems like different people you talk to are going to tell you different things. I think she was caught in a bit of what almost feels like a nesting doll of controversy. There uh, were uh, allegations of teacher misconduct at Douglas Anderson, you know, on a layer outside of that. It sort of mushroomed into larger concerns about the way the district is handling uh, allegations of teacher misconduct. On the layer outside of that were concerns that the school district was maybe underreporting crime, which was a problem identified yeah. in a grand jury report. And then on the layer outside of that, there is just this fraught political context in public education in Florida. Um, you know, Diana Green, I think, is the 10th superintendent now in the state since November uh, to be departing her post. Um, November saw the election of a lot of school board candidates uh, backed by the governor, who has made it very clear he kind of wants to remake the face of public education. Um, and so given all of that controversy and given the, the political backdrop, uh, there are some concerns that she was forced out and maybe forced out uh, prematurely uh, or forced out, you know, with, without good reason. Yeah, that, that those changes have been coming directly across the state from Tallahassee, it seems. I do want to give us a minute to talk about this. Nate, uh, incredible investigative journalist, by the way. So we've been watching a U.S. magistrate judge 
about this decision on whether to close portions of a pretrial hearing concerning JEA. All right, give us an update here because this magistrate judge actually ruled on this this week. He did. So uh, the, the underlying facts here are pretty complicated. I'll, I'll try to keep this I'll brief give you a and simple. And a yeah. <laughs> so as you mentioned, there is a there is an important uh, pretrial hearing that's set to begin May, set to begin May fifteenth um, in the criminal case against JEA's former CEO Aaron Zahn and CFO Ryan Wanamaker. The two men are, are arguing that prosecutors may have violated their constitutional rights. And this hearing is gonna sort that out, whether that happened. That's an important, it makes it an important hearing. If the judge decides there were violations of their rights, he could toss the indictment. Uh, important for us as journalists to be there, right? Important for us to be there, to understand why these decisions could be made. Uh, However, the judge has decided, uh, and, and this is based on something that the defendants asked for, uh, that portions of the hearing be closed to the public. So in what could be significant portions of the hearing, um, we, the newspaper and Channel 4 and First Coast News and Action News have all filed court papers to object to that. Yeah. Um, we have so far not been successful. So right now that hearing is set to be, portions of the hearing are set to be closed. Yeah, and so what this really tells us is the, the story isn't over with what happened at JEA and what consequences there might be. Something we're gonna continue following. Nate, I, I appreciate it. I know we could, we could really dive in deeper there but uh, it's a lot in the weeds for a pretty complicated, as you mentioned, a complicated story. So, Nate, thanks for your time today. Yep, thank you. All right, This Week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. And next week, for instance, City Councilman Matt Carlucci is going to join us. We're going to talk about some of the recent legislation that, uh, that he's uh, supporting. And he's going to talk a little bit about the mayoral race before we get to Election Day. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17 and online at newsforjax.com and streaming on News for Jax+. Plus. Why every day more people are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida, and South Georgia's number one source for local news.